Hi, hi, Andrew Enrich. It is uh, really good to have you with us. I'm I'm really excited about this uh, program. You've been going for a long time now in terms of uh, pyramid uh, research uh, theories about uh, how the pharaohs built the pyramids and and the some of the specifics of that. Uh, maybe here in the beginning, Joseph, you could just outline some of your main uh, theories for us, and then we can get go deeper into some of these uh, later on as well. But uh, specifically, as far as I under, uh, understand it. You have a very interesting theory about how the pyramids were built that has to do with uh, basic, basically casting uh, the limestone. Maybe we can begin there and, and explain that theory to us, uh, Joseph. Yes, uh, you must uh, first understand that I am a scientist, a true one, a hard, hard science scientist. That means I am well known for my discovery of a new uh, field of uh, chemistry, that is the geopolymer chemistry, which means that uh, we are capable of reproducing in our lab a lot of stone artifacts, a lot of uh, stony material that are practically identical to what Mother Nature is doing. So, and this is uh, this knowledge that I am uh, using in order to explain uh, archaeology that, from my point of view, the ancient people had uh, this knowledge. If uh, you go back to something that is uh, absolutely not well understood, namely uh, alchemy. Alchemy is uh, the science of the minerals. Uh, what I have discovered in the lab is that uh, we are practically doing modern alchemy. So we are replicating stones, we are um, letting uh, minerals to uh, react uh, between each other by adding uh, some uh, chemicals and uh, understanding the chemistry. And this is uh, this science that as I discovered in the years 1970s, first. And then, uh, because at that time I was also very curious about uh, uh, ancient civilization, uh, readings, a lot of books, you know, maybe remember, no, you are too young, uh, it was uh, the era of uh, Van Deniken oh, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. And uh, so I read all these books, I understood uh, their questions, but I thought that their answers were wrong. Hmm. So, and I started to transfer uh, the new knowledge that we had in the lab in order to bring some uh, answers uh, to uh, uh, these issues. Uh, and this is how it happened. It happened in 1974, uh, that is uh, 35, 36 years ago. And uh, I started from scratch, from zero on uh, that uh, topic and also it was at the same time that that also started uh, the science of uh, geopolymer chemistry and today 35 years ago i may claim that i am a well-known scientist for the discovery of uh, the geopolymer chemistry we have practically more than 400 laboratories in the world working on the subject and very famous one working with me with us on that topic that is exactly uh, dealing uh, with uh, uh, problems uh, that are really modern uh, sustainable technology uh, global warming mitigations uh, high temperature materials and so forth and so forth. So, forth. Mm. so this is just to show you that when I try to uh, focus on a subject, I go very deep in uh, the search as a scientist. And when I claim something, usually it is based on real uh, hard proofs, or if not 100% proof, but sometimes 95 or 96 or 97 percent truth and these are the three persons that are always discussed mm. and uh, this is the 
controversy is always now, today, based on the lack of some knowledge that uh, we have always to bring uh, to uh, light uh, with uh, further studies. So this has been a brief introduction of uh, who I am, and uh, I am so a scientist, and it happens that I am also a member of the International Associations of Egyptologists, which means that I am presenting my work uh, at Egyptologists' conference, like uh, any Egyptologists are doing it, mm -hmm. and my first conference on the topic of the possibility of making artificial stones uh, in Egypt was uh, presented in 1979, that is 32 years ago in Grenoble, in France. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, 1979, uh, seven years after I started uh, the research on uh, the development of this new uh, geopolymer technology in the laboratory. I presented two papers at this conference, one on the idea that the ancient Egyptians had all the knowledge in order to manufacture all kinds of stone artifacts, namely those that are very ancient and uh, are really, really strange, these stone vessels. When you go to the uh, British Museum, when you go to all the museums in the world, you see that the ancient Egyptians, the very from the first dynasty, from the second dynasty, that is 500 years or a thousand years before the pyramids were built, according to Egyptologists, were capable of mastering uh, the making of vessels mm. made out of hard, super hard stones. And for me, and from the beginning, uh, I uh, uh, tried to demonstrate that uh, these stones that look exactly like regular ceramic stones, uh, vessels made out of clay, were in fact made out of another material. Instead of taking clay, they took a uh, stone paste and made their vessels in that way. But to do this, you need the knowledge, that is, the chemistry, that is, alchemy, that is, the reaction between the minerals. And this is what I presented at uh, this Congress in Grenoble in 1979, with, uh, uh, and uh, my colleagues, uh, I had uh, 200 people uh, listening to my paper, they said, well, you are right, they had the knowledge. And maybe this is the, how uh, it had been done. Mm. And then the next uh, paper, one day later, was on the pyramid. I said, look, because they had this knowledge, in my opinion, they used it in order to make the stones, building stones. They said, no, this is impossible. And since that date, they said, no, it is impossible, period. <laughs> so you understand? Mm. I started to get the first samples. I had an official sample in 1980 81. We made our uh, analysis. We claimed that they, it, this sample, only one, uh, was uh, artificial. It was a, a casing stone that has been taken from the interior of the Cheops pyramid in the ascending passageway just before entering in the Grand Gallery, uh, the stones of this uh, passageway are coated with a coating that had a red, red paint on it. I presented the results at the next uh, geopolymer, uh, pardon, at the next International uh, Congress of Egyptology in uh, Toronto, Canada, in 1982. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they said, no, impossible. Then uh, in Cairo, 1988, at uh, the uh, congresses that we had there, I presented my first study on hieroglyphic texts. Then if the technology was used, it must have been written, uh, 1988. At the same year, I published my first book in New York, 
uh, the pyramid and enigma solved and this was the starting of the big controversy uh, and the big attack by uh, the opponents uh, i stopped any connection to uh, egyptology in 1990 i didn't want to enter into any polemical discussions the people were really nasty uh, they uh, really uh, uh, insulted me uh, some egyptologists uh, a lot of geologists and so forth i said uh, to myself stop wait until you get more knowledge mm. and i resumed this work in 2002 that is 12 years later 12 years later we were capable of manufacturing what I call genuine Egyptian stone. In our lab in Saint Quentin, north of Paris, we manufactured 15 tons of stone. You see, yeah, wow. when I am doing something, we do not use a small scale model in order to explain something. We do not use a three dimensional uh, computer programs that do not demonstrate anything. We we'll replicate it and we we'll replicate it in a big scale. Yeah. This is the only way to prove that you are right. So Correct. we started Correct. first in the lab yeah. and then we have done six uh, huge stone and this is how I started, I resumed my study on the pyramids. And now it is clear that it has been done in that way. And since that date, we have a more, more and more and more support from my scientific colleagues of a big institution in the world. And uh, this is uh, where we are now. Very, very interesting. Yeah. So why don't we talk a little bit about some of the you know, evidence that, that supports this. Obviously, we understand that you've been doing the experimentation with the, the, the geopolymers and how to put this together in terms of the, the minerals and, and the chemistry behind this. But let's say for somebody who's who's brand new to this, uh, Joseph, and they're listening for the first time, perhaps, uh, and, and they know about the pyramids, of course, they know, they know about uh, the, the stones that are, you know, that the pyramid is composed of. Uh, break it down a little bit for us and, and explain to how you think that, that this was done and achieved then by the ancient uh, Egyptians, uh, Joseph. Okay. Uh, first, uh, uh, they uh, have to go to our website, to the institute, the Geopolymer Institute website at geopolymer.org. There are several pages dedicated to uh, the pyramids, to the making of the pyramids, and we have uh, several videos. Uh, videos that replicate our experimentation, so they will have it, uh, have the demonstration in front front of, the, of them. When I started, when I started, and this is what you uh, said at the beginning of our talk, uh, you uh, talked about casting the pyramid. We are not casting. Uh, at the beginning, I uh, thought that uh, we were dealing uh, with uh, liquid. Uh, system liquid stone that was poured uh, into a mold. Uh, this is no longer uh, what I am claiming. Mm -hmm. uh, we are dealing uh, with uh, 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 concrete, um, uh, an aggregate uh, paste that uh, we are pounding with a rammer, like uh, doing uh, earth blocks, uh, like Pizze. So it is a material that is not liquid. It is a material that is uh, like wet sand. Hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so one has to manufacture it first. So we have, we take the limestone, the first natural ingredient. The stones of the pyramids are made of limestone, but they are not made uh, out of a uh, very beautiful limestone. It is a concrete and aggregation of fossil shells that are called numilites. These are shells that have the shapes of coins. And this is the nature of the pyramid limestone. Uh, the limestone bed are made, made out of this type of limestone. 
And it happens that at Giza, we have two types of limestone beds. One that is constituted with a very hard limestone and in between sandwiched a uh, limestone bed that is very weak and contains clays. And this is, in fact, uh, the uh, layer uh, in, uh, through which uh, the sphinx has been cut. And you know that the sphinx is deteriorating. It is uh, made out of a very poor limestone mm. that is had to be protected because it is a weak limestone that erodes very, very rapidly. Imagine if we would have in Egypt the same ring that we have in Europe, the Sphinx would no longer be there. That's right. You understand? Yep. And this is this raw material. This is this limestone that is the basic of the making of the pyramid blocks. And this is this limestone that has been exploited. This is where the quarries are. So we take a very weak natural limestone that is made of fossil shells and a little percent of uh, clay. And this is a very friable and a very uh, material that is sensitive to water. This limestone is disaggregated in water, that is chip, chip, chip in the quarries and uh, thrown down in uh, water ponds that are underneath, that are at the levels of the quarries. It happens that the quarries at, are at the same level as the Nile flood, which means the water is coming from the Nile and uh, kept there for uh, the manufacture of the stone. So we have a weak natural limestone, very easy to be disaggregated in water. Mm. We don't crush it, we disaggregate in water. We add to that the chemicals. Without chemicals, it doesn't work. And the chemicals that we add to this is first a salt that is called natron. Salt natron, that is a sodium carbonate. And the salt natron, it is the basis of the entire Egyptian civilization. You'll find millions of tons of natron scattered all over Egypt. And it is the salt that is used for the mummification. It is the basement of the Egyptian religion. The natron, sodium carbonate, added to another chemical that is normally lime, that is, you take limestone and you burn cancer it and you transform it into lime, and it reacts, and you invent the oldest chemical uh, reaction invented by mankind, that is, the production of caustic soda mm -hmm. that will start the reaction. So it is something very, very easy to, um, to, to, to start with, provided you have the material provided you have the chemistry, provided you have the chemicals, and the Egyptians had them at their disposal in millions of tons. So you put the chemicals in the water with uh, the, the limestone that is disaggregated and let it, the water evaporate. After two days in Egypt, the water is evaporating and uh, you get wet sand, wet aggregates that you put in a basket and you bring up to the pyramid site and uh, put it in a mold and compress it with a rammer. Rammer, that is, the molds are made out of small planks. Uh, each stone that has been previously made uh, is the mold for uh, the new one, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so forth, and so forth. And you get, and this is what we have replicated, and you get uh, the material that is a uh, limestone that contains 97% of natural element, 97% to which we have added Another natural element, which is a natural salt, natron, sodium carbonate, and the artificial one 
that is uh, the calcined limestone, which represents 1.5% by weight. That is nothing. That is what you have with you is a genuine limestone block. Mm. And you understand? Yeah. If you don't know the chemistry, that you will claim that it is a natural stone. This mm. is obvious. Mm. Then what you'll have in front of you are natural elements. Uh, I must tell you that at the beginning, people were really crazy. The opponents, they said, ha, 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 this is a natural stone. The proof is that it is made out of fossil cell shells. As they, 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 they claim that I was claiming that we were replicating in our lab the synthesis of fossil shells. They did not understood mm. that we were taking natural limestone, natural fossil shells, and using them as aggregates. And we were just uh, re-agglomerating them by just adding and compacting them together in order to uh, achieve uh, a new uh, uh, stable and hard material. And the material is really hard. It can support uh, three times the height of the Cheops pyramid. Hmm. Wow. That's okay. pretty... Yeah, yeah. So that's very, very interesting. That Let's talk just a little briefly about how strong this stone becomes as well, because obviously... And also, we we can compare it with some of the things that we do today in the in the so called modern world, right? We have our concrete or, or cement or betong or whatever you want to call it, and and that uh, is obviously much much weaker, right, than the stone that you find in the pyramids, correct? No, <laughs> no, no. Okay, <laughs> not uh, because what I uh, told about uh, previously, uh, I was talking about the mass, the massive. You are we are we are dealing with. Uh, the mass. These are on blocks that are very crude blocks. This is the, the, the two million blocks that are constituting the Cheops and the Chifren and all the big pyramids uh, are only there in order to feel something. They only, their duty is to resist, resist to compression. Okay, yeah. They don't have any other function. Uh, the casing stones are different. The casing stones are were there in order to protect the monument. So they are made out of a better system that has better property. From a civil engineering point of view, uh, this is something that is as good or better than our modern cement or modern concrete. Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. And uh, the casing stones are made out of very fine, it is always limestone, no marble, no alabaster, no, uh, and so forth. It is uh, limestone that is made out of very fine shells, fossil shells that have, uh, instead in the blocks, uh, they may uh, uh, have uh, dimensions in the range of uh, one centimeter to five centimeter in diameter. So these are big shells for the massive blocks, whereas uh, for the casing, stones, uh, they are in the millimeter range. But it is uh, the same limestone, and the difference is that the binder that is uh, constituting, that is bringing uh, the strength to this casing stone, is made out of a different uh, mineral that is uh, silicate. Instead of uh, clay, it is a silicate base, which gives it uh, higher strength, it needs uh, weathering, must withstand against weathering, yeah. and uh, the, uh, the these stones must also inside in uh, uh, be uh, ha have higher uh, flexural strength. So we are dealing with different type of stones that have been done differently with different systems implying a different chemistry and uh, they had uh, also a different purpose i see uh, yeah we are talking about limestone we are not talking about granite that's right so the granite at just here at the beginning for me the granite that we find in the king chambers uh, of the Cheops pyramid, the granite that we find as the casing of the uh, Chifren pyramid, the granite that we find as the casing of the Mykonos pyramid, and the granites that we find down, 
down uh, the causeway of Chifren in the Chifren Temple is natural granite. Mm -hmm. For me, it is clear. There is no these. We have the exception of uh, these stones, these granite are natural blocks that had to be brought from the southern part of Egypt. And the matter is un to understand why and how. Hmm. But we are witnessing two different types of technology. The one that is the reagglomeration, the making of fake stones. You know, uh, my last book is uh, uh, <clears throat> titled uh, Why the Pharaohs uh, Built Their Pyramids with Fake Stones. That's right. And uh, whereas uh, you see in several chapters in this book that I'm uh, um, claiming, stating that uh, for me the granite slabs are split granite, natural granite. Mm -hmm. hmm. Very. very uh, it is yes, because I have to I have to stress this because a lot of people are uh, either. Uh, telling, uh, look, uh, the granite is uh, natural. This is the proof that Davidovich is wrong because he is also claiming that the granite is artificial. This is not, I never claimed it. Yeah. And uh, second, uh, we are not capable of doing it in our lab. That's right. Well, it's good to cl clear <laughs> that up. The, the differences here, uh, Joseph, at the beginning, so people are clear in terms of what you're saying, what you're proposing and suggesting. Uh, so th that would that make everything more complete for you then, from your point of view, in terms of how they managed to to build the, the pyramids, and also, I mean, many people are are amazed at the you know um, architectural uh, feat that this was to pull this off. But from your point of view, if they build it from the base, you know, up in this particular manner with this technique, uh, do you see that it would be simpler to construct? You know the, um, the the hallway and the, the kings kings and queens chamber and all of that. Uh, does that make sense to how they did that, uh, Joseph? Um, I will disappoint you. Uh, I don't know. I'm a <laughs> chemist. I'm dealing with the material. Yeah. I don't want to be trapped in discussing how it has been built. Right. Then uh, there are so many ways to do it. I guess for me, it started from the from the center. And then it increased and increased and from, from, uh, in the, um, breadth and in the height and so forth. But I don't want to be, I am not an architect. Architects, uh, that are working on the subject, uh, have their uh, idea. Uh, we need, uh, ramps inside. We have to go inside. We have to go out and so forth. So it is connected with a, a severe, uh, civil engineering knowledge anyway. So please, I don't want to tackle this issue. I'm not a specialist in that system, and I don't want to be trapped in one idea, uh, which uh, is uh, not, in fact, my field of expertise. Absolutely, I understand. And uh, this is interesting to me as well, because I remember many years ago now, I heard some other researchers that were suggesting that the pyramids have been underwater. And proof of this was obviously that there have been fossils found you know, in or at the stones and things like that. But obviously, then, from, <laughs> yeah. from your point of view, this so, would make more so, sense. So, do, do, do you understand? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, this is, no, there are, there are several, several uh, claims of that type. Yep. First, they find fossils. Well, uh, this is the characteristic of the limestone, of the Eocene limestone that is constituting the um, Giza Plateau uh, that, according to science and geology, is 60, 60 million years old. So, yes, for 60 million years, uh, the plateau was underwater and the fossil shells were gently settling down and, and so forth. Yeah. So this is correct, but not uh, 10,000 or 12,000 years ago. The second argument that they are opposing is the fact that one find also at uh, the, uh, 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 on the stones, uh, some salts that are sea salts. Okay. Yeah. And they claim, yes, this is the proof that uh, they were, have been on, on the water. Uh, the problem is uh, the following. Uh, the sea, the salts that uh, we, have in the stones 
It is in fact the result of the chemistry. So we are manufacturing common salt, sodium chloride, sea salt, during the hardening of the, of the stone. Mm. And the quantity of stone of this sea salt that is uh, constituting the, the, the stones is very high, uh, sometimes up to 2, 2.5% by weight. Whereas uh, in uh, the <clears throat> natural bedrocks, uh, the content of uh, the sea salt of sodium chloride is not higher than 0.4%. So, uh, and this is the result of our uh, uh, chemistry, uh, the chemistry described on uh, the website. And you see the, how uh, the salt, uh, sodium chloride, is uh, the result of uh, one of the reaction. The problem is that the chemistry is providing natural elements that uh, can be claimed to be natural by people who don't understand the chemistry. Hmm. Interesting. Um, in in terms of uh, the dating problem, I mean, I, I heard you said twelve or, or ten thousand uh, years ago. Uh, have have you been able to uh, confirm in terms of dating anything closer because of the the way that these stones then were uh, put together with this particular technique, uh, Joseph? Uh, no, <laughs> I know this is a matter of discussion. Uh, we uh, have not been involved in uh, datation so far. They could be provided we have the permission to sample the system. Uh, since 1984, when I was uh, a professor at uh, the Institute of Applied archaeological science that I had founded at Barry University in Miami, Florida, I officially uh, requested from uh, the Egyptian antiquities the permission to sample the stones in order to really first make a scientific analysis about their constitutions and uh, invent uh, new datation methods. This has been declined, mm -hmm. rejected. Mm. By whom? By Zayawas. At that time, he was the inspector of uh, uh, the Giza Plateau. Uh, at the same time, he was uh, doing his PhD at, uh, in, uh, at the Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania University in Philadelphia. But uh, my request uh, was uh, <clears throat> rejected. And since that date, Zayawas is against any was against, he's no longer in charge, uh, is against any sampling of the pyramids for that purpose. I have several teams of colleagues who started research with geologists hoping uh, to get permission to uh, uh, sample uh, the stones, the pyramid stones, mm. and did, did not have one. Uh, remember, you uh, had uh, an interview with Robert Temple with his uh, dictation technique. Uh, he claimed at the beginning that he had the, the permission to uh, sample the pyramid stone, and this had been on the site declined. So this is a situation that uh, uh, a lot of people are facing. Uh, anything that is uh, going against uh, the official, uh, the official, uh, uh, what I say, uh, the- Very uh, version uh, of, yeah. No, it's more than that. This is the 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 the, the official statement of uh, the Egyptian uh, uh, Ministry of Tourism. Right, right. Uh, is declined. Uh, in fact, the fear that if uh, what we are claiming is uh, uh, the truth, then the tourists will no longer come to to Egypt because <laughs> they want to 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 look at something uh, unexplainable, marvelous, and so on, esoteric, and so forth which is wrong since, in fact, we demonstrate that these people were smart, uh, that uh, they were capable of achieving uh, things that we have just rediscovered now. Hmm. So what do you think is, um, is it going to be better in Egypt? I, I don't know if you've looked into this at all, uh, Joseph, uh, in, in terms of your time and whatnot, but uh, last thing I heard, uh, Sai Hawass was kind of not, uh, it's not too certain that he's going to remain in the position he's at anymore, right? No, he has, he, he, uh, has dismissed, uh, in, on the 6th of March, 
officially. Really? He's no longer in charge. Yes, wow. yes. There you go. Yes, do you yes, see that yes. as a positive sign or is it going to get worse down there? What uh, do you think? I, I don't know. Wait and see. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Huh? There's uh, obviously a number of other things that we need to talk about and go through. And maybe a little bit later we can talk about maybe the, if there's other monuments, as you mentioned, that were put together in this same uh, veneer and so forth in this same uh, with the same technique. But uh, the humidity inside the pyramids i know that you've talked about that it was uh, th that's also a, a, an aspect yes. i guess to your proof right yes uh the fact is that this is the first thing that you experienced uh, when you go inside is the fact that it is damp there it is very humid people are telling well this is the fact that a lot of people are coming inside now no because in the pyramids uh, where nobody is going in it uh, has the same amount of humidity inside uh you must understand that uh, when the stones are, when the material is rammed, it is wet. It contains uh, 9 to 10 to 12 percent by weight of water. And uh, this water has no time to evaporate because uh, it is surrounded by the other stones and then it will uh, be uh, covered by other stones. So the, the, the water remains inside. And uh, so the stones contains a lot of water. Uh, there have been a, a, a team uh, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, a team from uh, uh, an American team that uh, uh, scanned uh, the different pyramids uh, with, uh, with uh, radars uh, uh, trying to find uh, hidden chambers. And they uh, measured uh, the humidity of the stones and they found 8.5, 8 9% of water in uh, the pyramid stones, whereas uh, the genuine <coughs> uh, limestone from the bedrock in the vicinity is uh, contains uh, one or two percent by weight maximum. Hmm. Uh, so this is this is uh, something that is very interesting. And another proof is the fact that, as I told you, we are producing to, because of the chemistry salt. Sodium chloride. Yeah. And it is well known that all the chambers of the pyramids were covered with thick, thick, thick uh, crystals of salt when they were first discovered. Now it is clear. Now it is clean, but it is a one, two centimeter thick uh, salt that was covering uh, the chamber of the queen, not the granites. Understand mm -hmm. that are natural, yeah. But uh, all the others, uh, I went in uh, in uh, the pyramid of uh, Medum, uh, <clears throat> in the in the chamber inside. Uh, you'll get a lot of salt crystals, and the salt is the result of the evaporation of the water in the in these uh, in these chambers uh, because uh, the stones are salty. And I want you. The listeners, if they have the possibilities to, um, when they uh, travel to uh, the Giza Plateau, to the Cheops Pyramid, to take a piece of uh, off off a stone, even if it is uh, a broken stone lying on the on uh, on the ground, but close to the Cheops Pyramid, put it on their tongue, and it is salty. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And I got somebody. <laughs> Crazy. I said, yes, it is obvious. It is salty because uh, the limestone, the natural limestone, has been uh, sedimented uh, on the bottom of the sea. So these are crazy people that don't understand about uh, just a uh, uh, simple way of the making of stones and think because it was on the bottom of the, of the sea, it is obvious that it contains salt. Right, right. <laughs> you understand? I yeah. guess uh, you you have tested a lot of limestones in your life just for fun, maybe, and none are <laughs> salty. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, all the buildings that we, uh, well, in France, that are made out of stone, out of limestone, would be covered with a salty salt. uh, white powder. Right. Uh, you said that the salt had been uh, cleared. Now, is that through natural means, or has the the people in no, charge? No, no, no. These, these are these are these are these are the Egyptian antiquities. They cleared everything. There, uh. they, they they took it out. They rubbed it out. Uh, that's why Joseph then they they discovered these salt. I can't remember what it was when they when but when they went into the Gantenbrink's door again. 
uh, they discovered yes, that yes, there were still yes, salt there, yes. right? Because they, they hadn't cleared it there. Yes, they must. Of course. Yeah. And uh, it explains also in the Canton Big Doors that uh, the copper nails are corroded yes. because of the salt. Exactly. Interesting. And 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 since we are talking about uh, the Canton Brink uh, the shaft or the, uh, you remember if you when you look at the videos, uh, what you get in fact is uh, the robot is going through through through, and he is inside a casing that's a U shape, uh, 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 upside down, uh, a U shaped uh, container. That has absolutely no joint. It is something that is 10, 15, uh, 30 meters long. That is one piece of precast limestone. Mm -hmm. hmm. This is clear. How can you do this by digging through natural limestone? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. So what what else can you say that we've left out in terms of maybe how things were put together or how did maybe even how the egyptians d discovered this do you think that the, yes. this was a long process or, or how do they f get this knowledge uh, do you think joseph uh first uh we know uh, the name of the inventor and it is very clear the invention is uh <clears throat> the fact of one of uh, the greatest uh, egyptian scientist that is Imhotep, the builder of the first pyramid at Saqqara. It is the invention of the building with stone. Everybody is claiming this. Everybody is claiming, look, the first pyramid at Saqqara, the step pyramid, is the invention of building with stones. Before that date, the Egyptians were building their monuments with clay bricks. Hmm. I just say, as I used to study innovations, that the invention was using the same molds as making a clay brick, and they put a stone paste in the mold, and they manufactured their first stone brick. And this is how Imhotep invented the system. And you see, the step Pyramid at Saqqara is made out of small stones weighing maximum 60 kilograms that is easily uh, carried by carried by two, two men. Uh, and from that date, uh, the dimensions of the stones have improved yep. in dimension because they discovered that uh, the material was good, it was not cracking, and so on and so forth. And we see from the Pyramid of Saqqara. From the Pyramid of Saqqara until Sneferu, we see an increase of the stones. The stones are manufactured on the, uh, on the site and brought on the pyramid. So they are moved. They are not big, but they are becoming bigger and bigger. And the bent pyramid in Dashur, the one made uh, built by Sneferu, is in fact the last one that is using the system, the stones are becoming too heavy uh, to be continuously uh, moved. Yeah. And the next one, the red one, the big one from Seneferu, is made out of block of a very, very rough concrete. The shells are huge. These are, <laughs> these are oysters that are in the system. Do you understand? <laughs> really? Wow. And uh, really, really, really a bad material. It is, when you look at the, the west side of this pyramid, it is totally eroded. It is a bad material. And uh, from uh, from then on, jumped to uh, the Giza. So it was an improvement and an improvement. And then the catastrophe came on uh, during Mykonos and after. It has been a dramatic catastrophe uh, going on because of the using of this technology. Uh, for me, we are witnessing an ecological disaster. And explain that afterwards, the technology was no longer used, that afterwards, we have 
tiny pyramids that are small, uh, 20 meters, uh, 30 meters, 50 meters high. They are small heap of natural stone. Yeah. Do you understand? So, in other words, what you're saying here, Joseph, is that you, you, you can see the progression of how this technique was developed and refined and improved up to a certain point. And then yes. it goes backwards again. What, what happened? D disaster? T tell us more about that. Yes, uh, but I was to mention first that the, the development of the technology happened within 60 years. 60 it was years. a very, wow. very fast development yeah. between the, between, uh, the uh, first pyramid after the death of, uh, of uh, Djoser to uh, the Cheops pyramid is no more than 60 years. Hmm. Do you understand? Yep. It is a time where the, the Egyptian society was in favor of the innovation, and when uh, the society is in favor of an innovation, the development is very fast. Always. Yeah. And something happened because of the chemistry. Over-exploitation of materials that were vital to agriculture. Hmm. Explain. Uh, when you look at the evolution of the volumes of the material that have been used since the invention, since Zosa, the first pyramid, you see uh, an increase and increase and increase and increase to Cheops, and then Chifren is practically the same volumes, and then a dramatic drop to Mykerinos. Uh, Mykerinos is only 7% volume of the Cheops pyramid. It is very tiny. That means it needs only 7% material in comparison to Cheops. Mykerinos, if we take uh, the life, uh, uh, the uh, length of uh, the pharaoh's uh, life, uh, lived uh, also 20 years. And is, he, he built a, a tiny pyramid. And then afterwards, small. Mm. And Totally different a technique. Totally, this is crude. This is made out of, this is a heap of stone, a heap of material that had been gathered, taken from the direct vicinity of uh, the pyramid. And these are made of irregular stone, nothing stable, and so forth and so forth. What happened? Uh, when I uh, explained the chemistry, I told you that uh, we were taking natural limestone, easily disaggregated, that represents uh, uh, 95%, to which uh, that contained clay, or to which clay was added, and then the natron, the salt, sodium carbonate, and then lime, that results from the calcination of limestone. Mm. This is lime, uh, slick, slaked lime. Uh, for the people who understand chemistry, this is calcium uh, hydroxide, CaOH2, and so it has to be manufactured. Either we have two, two ways. Either you take limestone, like it is done today to manufacture uh, lime, slick lime that is used for in the building industry. Uh, so you consign it with uh, wood at 800 degrees C and you get a uh, quick lime that uh, afterwards uh, is hydrated. The second method is the, the one that was also used uh, by our uh, medieval ancestor in Europe, is uh, to use uh, the ashes of uh, wood. The ashes of wood, the ashes of oak, the ashes of uh, hard trees. Uh, when they burn, the ashes contains calcium yeah. in the ashes, up to 50 to 70% by weight of calcium oxide. And this is uh, the lime, what I call in my book, the lime ash. Right. That, for me, was used in the system. And why I'm using this one? Because we did not find any remains of kilns, industrial kilns, um, dedicated to the manufacture of the lime. Uh, the calculation that we made for Cheops uh, involves uh, the fabrications of... 150,000 tons of lime. Wow. Which means this is a factory. This yeah. is a regular plant, modern plant, uh, and we don't have any remains. In the, on the other side, we know 
that they burned wood, that they burned acacias, and that they burned palm trees. So acacia trees and palm trees are the trees that are very often found there, are available on the site. And these are uh, the, 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 the woods that have been used for to make uh, ashes, and better than that, to make embers. And this is related to something unique. Uh, the Egyptians had a very special way in backing their bread. Uh, on the pyramid site, uh, Zayahawas and uh, Mark Lena had have discovered uh, the village of the artisan, the village of the workers, where they lived, where lived, where these people were living, those who built the pyramids. Mm. And they found bakeries. They found bakeries, and we know uh, from these uh, uh, bakeries, and we know also from uh, the uh, the frescoes uh, that to make their bread, uh, they put the dough in a ceramic uh, vase, and this uh, ceramic vase was surrounded with red embers. Uh, they cooked it in ashes, in very hot ashes, in very red ashes. Mm -hmm. That means not uh, over an open flame as it is done today. Right. And this has been the way the Egyptians has made back their, uh, their bread uh, a thousand years long. And th this was they 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 uh, you know got two flies with one stone so to speak here because they got the ash obviously from the trees and also yes. at the same time they could make the the bread right yes and 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 Zayawas and uh, Marklina are claiming that they used a lot a great quantities of wood they have great uh, quantities of ashes mm. uh, they are claiming this in order to demonstrate that they used uh, these. Uh, these wood, they used them in order to make uh, uh, copper tools. You understand? Mm -hmm. They need also the energy. We don't need it. We just need to make the bread or and to collect uh, the ashes. And the ashes are there. So now, imagine the following scenario. Uh, you take uh, the palm trees, cut them down, and burn them in order to get the ash. Well, in Egypt, Palm trees are also there in order to provide shadow to agriculture. Yeah. When you go in the palm trees, you go there and you see underneath uh, agriculture is uh, providing two or three outcrops per year. It is a wonderful uh, place to let grow, to let any, 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 any food grow, uh, provided it is not burned by the, by the sun. Correct. And uh, the palm trees are providing the sun. They are providing dates also, but it is the main function is the sun. So now uh, you cut the trees for making the ashes. And of course, uh, these Egyptians were not uh, foolish. Uh, they uh, plant uh, uh, new uh, trees and uh, uh, in order to to get uh, the process going uh, uh, further yeah but the problem as uh, we see uh, in the development the quantities were always uh, higher and higher so that uh, during the Cheops and chief friend uh, it collapsed they needed more uh, ashes then nature was capable of providing. Uh, they had uh, a lot of new palm trees, but they were too small in order to be used as uh, 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 a place to uh, for agriculture. A uh, palm tree is a good uh, providing of shadow, but it needs uh, 60 years uh, to, to grow to that uh, height in order to provide, to be used, uh, and to be used as an, an agricultural place. So uh, it became uh, very, for me, uh, very, uh, very uh, uh, clear uh, that uh, they overexploited the palm trees and they got an ecological disaster with famines. And we have 
just after the pyramid, just after the big, big pyramid at Giza, uh, we have frescoes, bas relief that are depicting famine, people that are really starving are on these frescoes. Mm. So something happened. Uh, Egyptologists are claiming, well, this had been because of uh, climate change. Maybe yes, but for sure for me, it was the result of uh, the over-exploitation of uh, this system. And they discovered and decided no longer to use it at that scale because it was for their people. Yeah. Wow, that's that's really interesting, Joseph. And uh, it makes obviously you know obvious sense as well. Uh, depleting the the trees, their their resources, basically. Uh, could this also be the beginning of the desertification that that has happened in Egypt? Consequently, yes, of course, this yeah. is connected. Yeah, this is connected with that. And uh, you imagine that this has been uh, the uh, real. Uh, <clears throat> reason for the change of the dynasties, for the change of everything. Yeah. Very, very interesting, uh, uh, Joseph. Uh, you know what I think we should do here? I think we should uh, take a little break here between our uh, two segments. Uh, uh, it, this is a good time to give out uh, your websites, talk a little bit ab- about your books as well here before we round things up for the, the first uh, hour with you. Uh, your main website, your, your own personal, is davidovitz.com. Info uh, that's spelled D A V I D O V I T S Davidovitz dot info where people obviously can read more about your books and and your latest one is called Why the Pharaohs Built the Pyramids uh, with Fake Stones uh, we we mentioned that a little bit briefly as well but why don't you give us some of the titles um, I guess primarily in English but I guess you have some other ones in uh, French as well that are not published in uh, in in English uh, Joseph. Yes, uh, but before that, I want to also to remind you of my main of our main uh, website uh, of, of the Geopolymer Institute, uh, where you find uh, a lot of information, uh, especially about the technology. This is uh, Geopolymer, uh, G E P O L Y M E R dot org, and uh, this is uh, where you learn about the chemistry, you learn about uh, the technologies, uh, modern science, and there is a very special place uh, for archaeology, of course. Mm. Uh, the other books are dealing uh, with uh, the continuation of this study of uh, uh, the pyramids. Uh, as I told you, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the technology, the knowledge was there. It was continuously used at different scales, uh, essentially for uh, religious applications and for the making of uh, very small artifacts. Uh, For example, we have uh, in Paris, uh, in the Louvre Museum, a stele uh, that has been uh, engraved uh, uh, 2000 BC, uh, uh, and that uh, described uh, the sculpture uh, Hutchison, and it cl- he claims that I know the secrets of making fluid stone mm-hmm. to make statues and so and so. So, and we follow we follow these uh, the, the the evolutions uh, until until uh, the uh, the birth of. Uh, the second greatest Egyptian scientist, that is Amenophis, son of Hapu. Uh, so you have two great scientists, Imhotep, the inventor of the building of stone, and Amenophis, son of Hapu, who was uh, the re-inventor of this technology, who applied it for totally different purposes and who also happened for me to be as a scientist, as a scribe, as a philosopher, in fact, the model of the Joseph Patriarch, the Patriarch Joseph in the Bible, Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, Joseph that uh, is arriving in Egypt and uh, explaining (coughs) the dreams of Pharaohs. Huh. Uh, the Joseph is Amenophis, son of Apu. And uh, we discovered that we have 
plenty of texts that provide clues about the fact that Amenophis son of Apu, who lived um, in the 15th and 13th uh, century BC, that uh, just before uh, the uh, ecetic uh, uh, monotheist pharaoh Akhenaton, uh, that uh, Amenophis uh, son of Apu is in fact the Joseph of the Bible. Hmm. And we have the uh, frescoes uh, with a unique uh, uh, details uh, and so forth. So uh, the uh, the the study and it it, it happens that uh, this guy is using uh, the knowledge that uh, has been uh, used previously by by Imhotep uh, to make uh, the pyramid stones, but in fact he is. He is reusing the knowledge that the Egyptians had previously to manufacture their stone vessels. Mm -hmm. And one of his big master chief uh, uh, is the so-called Colossus of Memnon, the Memnon Colossus. These are huge statues, uh, monolithic st statues that are made out of quartzite, the uh, super hard stone. Uh, 20 meters high, uh, 1,500 tons, impossible to carve, impossible to, to sculpt. Yeah. And in fact, he has written how he made it. And this is uh, the <clears throat> one of the, uh, the proofs of the use of this uh, knowledge. And the use of this knowledge is in fact connected uh, with uh, what we find in the ancient testament in the bible as uh, always uh, when we uh, uh, read about uh, technology uh, in the bible uh, the technology used to make artifact out of stones is this uh, technology the technology of making artificial stone uh, i wrote all these books in french uh, I started in uh, 2004, it's now my third. Uh, you'll find also in <clears throat> my website a uh, small uh, description in English. And uh, the latest one is uh, The Lost Fresco and the Bible. In the years 1970s first. And then, uh, because at that time I was also very curious about uh, uh, ancient civilization, uh, readings, a uh, lot of books, you know, maybe remember, no, you are too young. Uh, it was uh, the era of uh, Van Deniken oh, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. And uh, so I read all these books. I understood uh, their questions, but I thought that their answers were wrong. Hmm. So, and I started to transfer uh, the new knowledge that we had in the lab in order to bring some uh, answers uh, to uh, uh, these issues. Uh, and this is how it happened. It happened in 1974, uh, that is uh, 35, 36 years ago. And uh, I started from scratch, from zero, on uh, that uh, topic. And also it was at the same time that I also started uh, the science of uh, geopolymer chemistry. And today, 35 years ago, I may claim that I am a well-known scientist for the discovery of uh, the geopolymer chemistry. We have practically more than 400 laboratories in the world working on the subject and very famous one working with me, with us on that topic that is exactly uh, dealing uh, with uh, uh, problems uh, that are really modern, uh, sustainable technology, uh, global warming mitigations, uh, high temperature materials, and so forth and so forth. Mm. So this is just to show you that when I try 
to uh, focus on a subject. I go very deep in uh, the search as a scientist. And when I claim something, usually it is based on real uh, hard proofs, or if not, for me, and from the beginning, uh, I uh, uh, tried to demonstrate that uh, these stones that look exactly like regular ceramic stones, uh, vessels made out of clay, were in fact made out of another material. Instead of taking clay, they took a uh, stone paste and made their vessels in that way. But to do this, you need the knowledge, that is, the chemistry, that is, alchemy, that is, the reaction between the minerals. And this is what I presented at uh, this Congress in Grenoble in 1979, with, uh, uh, and uh, my colleagues, uh, I had uh, 200 people uh, listening to my paper. They said, well, you are right. They had the knowledge. And maybe this is the, how uh, it had been done. Hmm. And then the next uh, paper, one day later, was on the pyramid. I said, look, because they had this knowledge, in my opinion, they used it in order to make the stones building stones. They said, no, this is impossible. And since that date, they said, no, it is impossible, period. So you understand? Mm. I started to get the first samples. I had an official sample in 1980-81. We made our uh, analysis. We claimed that they it, this sample, only one, uh, was uh, artificial. It was a, a casing stone that has been taken from the interior of the Cheops pyramid in the ascending passageway just before entering in the Grand Gallery. Uh, the stones of this uh, passageway are coated with a coating that had a red, red paint on it. I presented the results at the next uh, geopolymer, uh, pardon, at the next international uh, Congress of Egyptology in uh, Toronto, Canada, in 1982. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they said, no, impossible. They, hi, hi, Andre Enric. It is uh, really good to have you with us. I'm, I'm really excited about this uh, program. You've been going for a long time now in terms of uh, pyramid uh, research uh, theories about uh, how the pharaohs built the pyramids and, and the, some of the specifics of that. Uh, maybe here in the beginning, Joseph, you could just outline some of your main uh, theories for us and then we can get go deeper into some of these uh, later on as well. But uh, specifically, as far as I under understand it, you have a very interesting theory about how the pyramids were built that has to do with uh, basic, basically casting uh, the limestone. Maybe we can begin there and, and explain that theory to us, uh, Joseph. Yes, uh, you must uh, first understand that I am a scientist, a true one, a hard, hard science scientist. That means I am well known for my discovery of a new uh, field of uh, chemistry, that is the geopolymer chemistry, which means that uh, we are capable of reproducing in our lab a lot of stone artifacts, a lot of uh, stony material that ha are practically identical to what Mother Nature is doing. So, and this is uh, this knowledge that I am uh, using in order to explain uh, archaeology that, from my point of view, the ancient people had uh, this knowledge. If uh, you go back to something that is uh, absolutely not well understood, namely uh, alchemy. Alchemy is uh, the science of the minerals. Uh, what I have discovered in the lab is that uh, we are practically doing modern alchemy. So we are replicating stones, we are um, letting uh, minerals to uh, react uh, between each other by adding uh, some uh, chemicals and uh, understanding the chemistry. 
And this is uh, these signs that as I discovered in, in, uh, in Cairo, 1988, at uh, the uh, congresses that we had there, I presented my first study on hieroglyphic texts. Then if the technology was used, it must have been written, uh, 1988. At the same year, I published my first book in New York, uh, The Pyramids and Enigma Solved, and this was the starting of the big controversy uh, and the big attack by uh, the opponents. Uh, I stopped any connection to uh, Egyptology in 1990. I didn't want to enter into any polemical discussions. The people were really nasty. Uh, they uh, really uh, uh, insulted me, uh, some Egyptologists, uh, a lot of geologists, and so forth, I said uh, to myself, stop, wait until you get more knowledge. Mm. And I resumed this work in 2002, that is 12 years later. 12 years later, we were capable of manufacturing what I call genuine Egyptian stone in our lab in Saint Quentin, north of Paris, we manufactured 15 tons of stone. You see, yeah, wow. when I am doing something, we do not use a small scale model in order to explain something. We do not use a three dimensional uh, computer programs that do not demonstrate anything. We replicate it and we replicate it in a big scale. Yeah. This is the only way to prove that you are right. So Correct. we started Correct. first in the lab, yeah. and then we have done six uh, huge stone, and this is how I started, I resumed my study on the pyramids. And now it is clear that it has been done in that way. And since that date, we have a um, recent proof, but sometimes 95 or 96 or 97 percent truth and these are the three persons that are always discussed mm. and uh, this is the controversy is always now today based on the lack of some knowledge that uh, we have always to bring uh, to uh, light uh, with uh, further studies so this has been a brief introduction of uh, who I am, and uh, I am so a scientist, and it happens that I am also a member of the International Associations of Egyptologists, which means that I am presenting my work uh, at Egyptologists' conference, like uh, any Egyptologists are doing it, mm -hmm. and my first conference on the topic of the possibility of making artificial stones uh, in Egypt was uh, presented in 1979, that is 32 years ago in Grenoble, in France. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, 1979, uh, seven years after I started uh, the research on uh, the development of this new uh, geopolymer technology in the laboratory. I presented two papers at this conference, one on the idea that the ancient Egyptians had all the knowledge in order to manufacture all kinds of stone artifacts, namely those that are very ancient and uh, are really, really strange, these stone vessels. When you go to the uh, British Museum, when you go to all the museums in the world, you see that the ancient Egyptians, the very from the first dynasty, from the second dynasty, that is 500 years or 1,000 uh, years before the pyramids were built, according to Egyptologists, were capable of mastering uh, the making of vessels mm. made out of hard, super hard stones. And for 